Hi, I'm Greg Dell, joined by attorney Frank Darris, and today we're going to talk about what it takes to win a long-term disability insurance appeal. Uh, Frank, you've handled thousands of long-term disability appeals, and uh, in this video I want to give people tips and kind of like a guide as to what it's going to take from you get this horrific denial letter until the point in time that you submit the claim because a lot of people have this misconception when they speak to the representative from the insurance company who are usually, their protocol is usually is they're going to call, try to get you on the phone, and then they say a letter is going to follow. But often they don't get the person on the, on the phone and then they send a letter, right? And people are in shock. And I want them to understand, like, listen, there's solutions out there and it's, it's not the end of the day and you are going to get a fresh bite of the apple, but you got to go about it the right way. So let's go through this kind of methodically from the beginning of what a person should do until the processes that you go through when representing clients to submit a great appeal. So here you go. Terrific question. <laughs> so for me, I'm getting ready to <coughs> almost 40 years. So many, many hundreds and thousands of, of denial letters. And I tell clients, it's just the beginning of the day. This is now our opportunity to, to do the things that can bulletproof and make sure that they can get their benefits because the benefits should be rich. They've been paying premiums or the employer's been paying premiums and people need their benefits. They need food, they need gas, they need to keep the kids in school. And that's our job as promise enforcers to be able to try and make sure that they can do it. So what do I do? I, I, I want the insurer to first and foremost get the denial letter. The denial letter is gonna lay out generically the reasons that the insurance companies decided that they weren't yet able to pay the benefits, even if they'd paid before. Now they've decided that there isn't enough medical evidence, there isn't enough vocational evidence, that they can do some other work or their doctor's a problem. So number one, get the denial letter. Okay, and then what's the, once they get the denial letter, is there a certain format that these are usually in? And I'm, we're gonna talk more along, whether it's an individual disability or a group ERISA govern policy, that doesn't really matter necessarily for the purposes of this video because you're kind of going to take the same steps per se, although group is a little bit different. Talk about what you do once you get the denial letter. Sure. So oftentimes people think <coughs> that it was a mistake. The benefits were denied mistakenly. The, they didn't get the right records or the doctor said something that, you know, they can correct quickly. And the difficulty is that people often don't appreciate that when you submit an appeal, it's game over in terms of generally being able to supply any more information to the insurance company. So oftentimes I'll hear people say, oh, my claim rep was so nice. They said all I had to do, Greg, was submit a one-liner to say, <coughs> I appeal your wrongful decision. The problem is, the record will then be closed. You won't later, even if you get great counsel, be able to add to the administrative record because you get one chance. Now some of these policies have two appeals, some have three appeals, and we try and load up the evidence so that when a federal judge is looking at this claim later on, they see that there's objective evidence, they see there's subjective evidence, they got the medical, the vocational, and the financial. So those are things that, that are super important. Don't believe the insurance company. If they say to you, all you need to do is a one-line appeal, because we're going to have new people take a look at the claim. That's a fatal claim mistake. We can't do that. When you get this denial letter, there's almost always a line that says you can request a copy of the administrative record. What is that? Why is it important and what do you do with that thing when you get it? So when you get the denial letter, you mm. want to make sure that you can gather every piece of paper <coughs> that comprises the administrative record. The administrative record is what the insurance company did from the time you became eligible for the insurance coverage. Everything that happened during the claim, everything you submitted, everything your doctor submitted, everything that they did in terms of internal workings, did they have an on-site physician look at it? Did they have a nurse look at it? Did they have a claim supervisor look at it? Anything that happened up until the date of the denial. And you can request 
that administrative record. They should give it to you for free. Usually it comes to us on a disc, and I'm old, so I like paper. I print the disc to be able to see what they gave me. Should start at the beginning with how you applied or how you got the coverage, what happened when you submitted the claim. You'll see all your records. Sometimes they may not give you the psych records. If you've got a really difficult psych claim, they don't want bad things to happen. But we print the administrative record, or if we're going to get counsel to be able to help and assist and facilitate, remember, you take on a billion dollar insurance company, they're prepared for your appeal, and they try and create this landscape of mistakes. We can't make a mistake on the administrative appeal. It's the only case you have. So when you request this administrative record, and, and most of these claims give you 180 days to submit an appeal, and usually it takes around three to four weeks to get this administrative record because the insurance company has to put it together, and then they got to mail it to you. And, and you get it, and oftentimes they're a minimum of 500 pages, and you've had them where they're tens of thousands of pages, especially if a claimant's been on claim for six, seven, or eight years. So it can be very voluminous. I know it comes to your office, and you tear this thing apart and go through it and then say, we're going to put a strategy in place now based upon, I understand from reviewing their file why they denied your claim. Because the denial letter is supposed to be detailed, but it's usually a form letter from the company with a couple fill in the blanks. But when you're going through this thousands of pages administrative record, what are the key documents in there that you're looking for so that now you can set your plan of attack moving forward to prepare a great appeal? Sure. So for us, <coughs> I want to make sure the insurance company sits up and takes notice about what we do on our administrative appeal. It's going to be the most comprehensive appeal and it should come to life to the reader. So first and foremost, we cron the file. We want to make sure that chronologically we can see everything that happened along the way. Here was the claim. This was the medical evidence that supported the claim. These, this was the occupation. These were the demands of the occupation, cognitive, physical, financial. Uh, are you totally disabled? Are you partially disabled? The financial aspects will, will come in. Second, what's your benefit? So that we can make sure that they calculated your benefit correctly. Oftentimes I'll see an insurance company jip or cheat or lowball or try and create an opportunity where the benefit should be 1500 a month. Turns out it's 700 a month because they didn't calculate the benefit correctly. So chronologically, let's walk through and make sure that we can cron the file to a chronology, start to finish. Second, medical records. What medical records did they gather? And more importantly, what medical records didn't they gather? If they knew or should have known about a doctor, if they knew or should have known about <coughs> medication, they should have done a canvas to be able to gather up the prescription records. Let's make sure that those m prescriptions are, are, are gathered. Did they get them or didn't they get them? Did they get all the records or didn't they get all the records? Any financial issues? Let's sort that out. Vocational issues. I always like, Greg, to have a vocational expert who can tell me the demands of an occupation. Because an insurance company is going to look at those demands and minimize. They're going to minimize the requirements. If we say you've got to lift 20 pounds for your work, they're going to say you can lift less than 10 pounds. If we say it's a cognitively demanding job, they're going to say, no, a squirrel could do that work with no problem. So we want to make sure that we've got a vocational expert that can lay out those demands. Next, I look at the objective evidence. When was the last time you had an MRI, a CT scan, uh, an objective X-ray? You got cognitive problems? Have you been tested? I like neuropsych testing so that my people can be evaluated while they're taking the medications that say they've got a problem. So we want to gather a team of experts to be able to supplement the care, the treatment, and the objective and subjective testing so we can put together a comprehensive appeal. Are, is the disability insurance company required to give you copies in this administrative record <coughs> of the medical reviews, if any, that they've done? Yes, they are. And oftentimes, they, they'll forget the name, or the name will be blocked out on the doctor. I've done hundreds of thousands of appeals. And I know who the frequent flyers are. And when I say frequent flyers, insurance companies use 
doctors to do what we call paper reviews. Paper review means the doctor isn't going to talk to you, not going to evaluate you, generally won't call your treating physician, but they're going to do a paper review. They minimize, they normalize, and then they capitalize. Because in most of these cases, you and I can't take the deposition of this paper reviewing doctor the insurance company's hired. For those of us that do this on a very regular basis, we've got a catalog, we've got a diary, we've got a library full of reports so that if you say Dr. Smith, I can go to my cabinet and pull out every Dr. Smith report that I've seen over the last almost 40 years. It tells me who's been fair, who's been right, and whether they've been overused. And it's another opportunity for us to create leverage in an administrative appeal that the normal insured wouldn't know. Typically, the insured, Greg, will go to their doctor, ask their doctor to write a letter. The doctor generally won't put in the occupational demands, isn't looking at neuropsych testing to support the cognitive deficits, and isn't looking at the financial aspects. So we got to put together a comprehensive appeal with the very best team of experts so that there's no doubt you're going to get paid. When, when you find this medical review that's inside the file, sometimes it's even just a nurse or it's an in-house doctor that's staffed by the, the insurance company, sometimes they go to a third party doctor like you said, the denial letters commonly are just citing the same language from this internal doctor or nurse's medical review. Why is it that it's often just a rubber stamping in the denial letter of what that doctor had said? I wish, I wish mm -hmm. that they were real doctors. The on-staff physicians at most of the insurance companies haven't practiced real medicine in over 20 years. They, they don't have a staff. There's no medical malpractice insurance because they haven't treated anybody. So. As I look at these files and I look at the education, training, and experience of an on-site insurance company doctor, I question, when was the last time you saw a real patient? You treated somebody with a real problem. If it was your wife, your kid, your best friend, would you have called this file the way you did in this insurance case? I look at them and ask the question often, are, are they the king of no? You know, not enough treatment, right. not enough medication, not enough care. There's not enough frequency or intensity of the treatment. So we've got to take a look at those on-site doctors and first question our education, training, and experience. Second, you give me a current curriculum vitae for that doctor. So I can go check the records. Is this a doctor that's had malpractice complaints? had a case last week where a doctor had his own drug problems, yet he was calling my insured a drug addict. <laughs> That's not okay. Right. You, know, you can't throw tomatoes from the cheap seats in right. these kinds of cases. <laughs> so it's really important to, to, to take apart the background education, training, and experience of the insurance company doctors and call it for what it is. You wouldn't go get heart surgery from a podiatrist. You probably shouldn't take for granted or for gospel an insurance company doctor that hasn't treated somebody for 20 years. Stop it. Well, that, that's a good point. Um, in terms of tools that are available to you when handling an appeal, uh, you mentioned you like vocational experts. What are some of the other things that, you know, most people who get an appeal, they're like, I'm gonna write, a, I'm denied. what do you mean? I, I can't go to my job. I'm making less money on disability. The last thing I wanna do is not be working. And you tell me to go ahead and write an appeal and tell you why. I'm disabled, but it's more than just going back to the doctor, your treating doctor, there's other things you can do. And so what do you recommend and what, asks, what resources are available to you that benefits claimants who are gonna do an appeal? I've been a lawyer for almost 40 years and it would be hard for me as a disability lawyer doing nothing but disability for four decades to sit and do a job demand for myself cognitively to do a litany of all the things that I need to do to stay mentally focused with sustained attention and, and concentration, et cetera. How is somebody that's disabled from a physical or a mental problem gonna first understand the administrative record? Second, to try and attack it to 
make a meaningful argument about their vocation or their occupation. Most times people talk about their job. It's not the job that you got insured for. It's the occupation. And they're going to look at the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, and I know that sounds like Greek mm. or, or gibberish, yeah. but the Dictionary of Occupational Titles will talk about whether your job is sedentary, a medium, heavy, the demands physically and, and mentally. I like a vocational expert because they're trained, they're educated, they can pick the salt out of the pepper as it, as it relates to the, to the occupation. Second, I really do like to look at the treating doctor as a, just a tremendous resource. Let's give them some more tools. Let's give them some objective testing. If we haven't had an MRI in a year, it's time. If we can go get neuropsych testing to be able to evaluate the insured's cognitive problems, let's give them that test. How about a functional capacity evaluation where I send my insured two days in a row for four hours. They're gonna bend, lift, stoop, push, pull, carry, put a square peg in a round hole or whatever the occupational demands are, and we're gonna see it two days in a row. So we see what happens the next day. That's such a valuable resource for our treating physician who then can say, I've seen him, I've evaluated him, I've treated him twice a month or once a month for the last 28 months. He has no reason to feign. He's not a malingerer. She has done every test I've asked her of her. She falls into the unfortunate category of somebody who's permanently disabled. And as lawyers, we owe it to our people, our clients, to make sure that we've pulled out every resource to give them the best chance of overturning an administrative appeal. So you brought up some great tools about whether it's a functional capacity exam, whether it's a neuropsych exam, whether it's a vocational analysis from an expert. These are resources that are just not readily available to people. I know you have these resources available all over the country for your claimants and have worked with them many times in the past to put together what we consider to be objective evidence because disability carers always say, well, you have no objective evidence, you only have subjective complaints and therefore we don't believe you. But the other thing that you touched on that's so important is while we have what I call these tools of available excerpts and other tests, it then comes down to the treating doctors. And you know the disability companies often have these, what I call, short and abbreviated and almost nonsense attending physician statements that are basically designed to set the doctors up to give limited information so that they can get the forms and be like, there's not enough medical support because they give them maybe one line if they're lucky or check a particular box and it's very self-limiting intentionally. So I know that when we handle all of our appeals, we always do these extensive custom attending physician statements, which is the totality of taking all the information we've gathered from additional testing, additional medical treatment, vocational reports, send it back to the doctor, not just say to the doctor, hey doc, what do you think now? But guide the doctor with a multi-page potential attending physician statement specific to the job, like you were saying, and the language of the policy. So it's a complete 360 degree circle. You gotta go, but you gotta go step one, step two, step three, step four. You gotta come all the way around to make it happen. And while people go, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna have income for 180 days. We wanna get it done as quick as possible, but you can't rush it. It takes time to get all of this particular testing done, get all the information, get back to the doctor, get the doctor to cooperate, get the claimant back in a few times with the doctor so we can get contemporaneous and real time, you know, here's what's going on up to date, but also what was going on the day before you denied the claimant. And this is, is a tremendous burden for the claimant. It's, it's a losing battle almost for a claimant who doesn't have someone who's done this. And you remember when you started, how long did it take you to get a grip on how do I do a proper appeal from when you started and you, your first job and someone said, here, Frank, do this appeal versus to, you know, I, I know from you taking hundreds of depositions and reading claims handling manuals and seeing everything to get to the point where you are. It's a, it's a tremendous undertaking. And I really want people to understand that because I hate to see them. We always fall back to don't do the one liner. Don't just say appeal. Don't just have the doctor write a letter. Could you win? Maybe. But are you doing everything you can? Absolutely not. So um, 
you know, we do this video to make it educational for people, let them know you have resources out there. I know we always provide a free consultation for people. We'll review the file, we'll let them know where we stand. We never charge any fees or costs unless we win. So there's no obligation to just call us, let us help look at it, say, hey, here's what it is. Here's a potential roadmap for what you can do. If you can do it on your own, fantastic. We'll be there to help you if you don't win. If you want our help now, this is your one shot. We'll do the best freaking thing we can in the world for you. So thank you for you know sharing your information. If you're someone out there who has a long-term disability denial and you need to submit an appeal, feel free to call Frank, myself, any of our long-term disability lawyers are available to assist you. And no matter where you live in the country, we look forward to speaking with you.